session of ACCA P3 in which we will be looking at the numbers part of the syllabus. So we're going to be looking at chapter 8 and we're going to be looking at chapter 9 of the notes. Now one thing that I should, let's go back to me again, one thing that I should point out is that if you had been studying ACCA um, before June 2011. So if you had finished in December 2010, chapter 8, chapter 9, you wouldn't have had to bother with because they weren't in the syllabus. They, have been, they were added in in the June 2011 exam. And they've obviously been there ever since. Now, it's just, it's important just to make everybody aware, make you guys aware of why chapter 8 and chapter 9 are now in the notes. Why? the examiner put this in because it affects the way things are tested. And I think a lot of students don't really get this. They don't really understand this. What the ACCA have said is that um, when they introduced the syllabus, 2007, it had been running for a few years and then they started getting complaints from employers, basically saying, students do not really understand the role of management accounting numbers when it comes to making strategic decisions. So using numbers to do F5, to do variances, no problem whatsoever. Students are absolutely fine with that. But if a student gets asked to, to do something which is supporting a one-off decision, so in other words, something that is not standard. They don't seem to know how to do it. And of course the problem was, the problem was that everybody had to do F5 and then P5, which is where this gets tested, was optional. So a lot of students didn't do P5. So a lot of students did F5 and that's the only management accounting that they knew. And so the ACCA said, well, management accounting is about making decisions. Now that's what P3 is about. P3 is about making decisions. So it makes sense to put the management accounting in the P3 syllabus. So that's why we now have it. And it's important that you guys are okay with that because there's two key things that come up over and over and over and over again in the exam. First of all, you are making a strategic choice and you need to calculate some numbers to help you to make that choice. Now that's very much like a P5 kind of question in that every single exam question is different. It's not like F5 where they're always the same. A variance is a variance is a variance is a variance. They're all the same thing. In P3, you might have to say, in this question, I need to do this. And in a different question, I need to do that. But I need to calculate some numbers to help me make a decision. So that's the first kind of question you get. The second kind of question you get is where the examiner has done the calculations for you. And what he wants you to do is he wants you to say, first of all, what do the calculations mean? What do they tell you? And second of all, do you actually agree with what I've done? So the first kind of question is, there are some numbers you choose what to calculate and then use it to make a decision. Second kind of question, the calculation is done for you, you tell me what it means, and you tell me whether I've even done the right thing. I will tell you now that normally, in that second kind of question, the examiner has done something inappropriate. He's done it correctly, the calculations are correct, but he's used something he shouldn't have done, because that's just the way that he does the questions. So. It's very important when we're going through the material in chapter 8 and chapter 9 to remember the calculations themselves in the exam are not really the point. There are some easy marks there. There's normally, you know, for a calculation, there's normally three or four marks, and they're usually not that bad. But the key thing is, oh, well, what does it mean? And students are good at saying, well, I say good, some students are good. It's not as good as it should be, let's put it like that. Some students are good at saying, there's my calculation, it's correct, but they're often very bad at saying what it means. I should also point out, this bit keeps getting added to. 
As you guys will know, the syllabus gets revised on a fairly regular basis, and for some reason that I can't say I understand, chapter eight and nine are the bits that keep having material added into them. Not very much each time, but it is growing and growing and growing and growing. And overall, students deal with this very, very, very badly. For example, the idea of fixed and variable costs. What is a fixed cost? What is a variable cost? And what makes it vary is done incredibly badly. There was a question a while ago. Um, you had to, it was about a college course and you had to work out the costs for the company for the year. And you basically had three kinds of costs. You had a fixed cost. You had a variable cost that depended on the course and another variable cost that depended on how many students there were. So you had a cost per student and you also had a cost per course as well as a fixed cost. Lots of students just didn't get that at all. They mixed up the two variable costs. So they said, in effect, every time you have an extra student, you have to pay the lecturer's fees again. No, the lecturer is per course. You had to pay material per student so one was the more students, the more material, but the lecture cost doesn't change. And one was the more courses, the more lectures you need. Students mixed it all together. It was a complete disaster. And it was actually very straightforward, but people couldn't do it. So let us have a look then at chapter eight and chapter nine. And chapter eight and chapter nine, the numbers parts are done worse than they should be. Done. A lot of students get the chapter eight and chapter nine correct. But a lot, of, an awful lot of students get something relatively straightforward wrong. A lot of students can't do it at all. They get nothing on these bits at all. Now, I know it sounds obvious, but it is an accounting exam. You know, it's not unreasonable to expect people to do account, basic accountancy, call of, um, basic stuff that you've seen. All the stuff you're going to do here, we've done in chapter, you've done in paper F5. All F5 stuff again. If you haven't done F5, it's not a disaster, but it's going to help if you remember it. Right, good example of, remember we said there's two kinds of questions. Good example of the first kind of question, December 2013, question three, part B. Use the data provided. Show why HGG is losing money. So you have to work out what to do. And then recommend some changes, quantifying how much difference it would make. The first bit was done very well. It's a fairly easy calculation. The second bit, most students said, here is what I recommend they should change, but I won't actually answer the question because I won't put any numbers in to support that because it wasn't as obvious what to do. The second kind of question I said is where the examiner has done something and you basically get to talk about it. And the, an example of the second kind of question is the question underneath, June 2011. Evaluate Barry's comments. In other words, somebody's done a net present value. Barry, who is the owner of the company, comes along and says, that NPV was done wrong. We shouldn't have done this. We should have done that. We should have put this in. We should have left that out. And you basically have to say whether you agree with Barry. Some of his comments are correct. Most of his comments are incorrect. So you have to say, Barry, you're wrong about that comment because... Barry, you're wrong about that comment because Barry, you're correct about that comment because, but you didn't have to do the NPV. That was already done for you. A lot of students simply recalculated the NPV and at the end of it, they said, the examiner has calculated it correctly. Yeah. We know the examiner's calculated it correctly. You had to say whether you agreed with what had been done. So let's have a look then. First of all, 8.2 standard costing. Standard costing and variances. Standard costing and variances are in the syllabus. They have been in the syllabus since June 2011. And I personally, I personally think that you will not be asked to do the variances. I think you are more likely to be asked to say why they are happening. So I think the examiner will do the variances and you say why they're going on. That, in effect, is strategic analysis again. So let's imagine that we have an adverse materials price variance. What does that mean? 
that means we're paying more than we thought we were going to. Why would that happen? Porter's Five Forces, a powerful supplier. Uh, Labour rate. Why do we pay more for labour than we thought? A powerful supplier. So, for example, you have a workforce which has got a very powerful union which is involved. Labour efficiency. I said labour efficiency, I mean labour usage. I do, I do apologise. Why would we have an adverse variance there? Poor quality labour. Sales price variance. I'm picking these at random. So sales price variance, powerful customers. Remember, materials price is your supplier. Sales price is your customer, so powerful customers. Now, you notice, with the exception of the poor quality labour, the yellow one I've got there, the green ones and the blue ones, I've also got sales volume and sales price there. They are all, that's basically ports of five forces. So if variances are tested, they may well be linked to ports of five forces. Why has this gone down? Because we've got powerful customers. Why has that gone down? Because there's new entrants. Why has this gone down? Because there's lots of substitutes. Now, I think that that's more likely to be in the exam than the stuff that you did in F5, it is poor quality. It is good quality. Remember, in F5, it's basically quality. In P3, we're much more interested in outside things, external things, so that's why I think these are more likely to occur. Um, outside things being the reason for the variances. Right, let's just have a look at the kind of question that you might get. So, cool freeze. This is an example from the pilot paper. The pilot paper is in the front of the study manual. Uh, I don't think it's in the revision kit. I think it's in the study manual. Now, you've got various bits and pieces of information here. We're only going to look at part of the question. And then it says, write a briefing paper that analyzes what's gone on. Now, we are told Figure three, there is, I, I don't think there's a figure two, if I remember right. That's in the other part of the question. I've put the other part in chapter nine rather than in chapter eight. So figure three, analysis of budget and actual information. Now, obviously, what you could do is you could simply say the actual numbers are better than the budgeted numbers. So, for example, raw materials, we only spent 15,000 where we thought we would spend 29,000, that is a favourable variance of $14,000 because we spent $14,000 less than we should have done. That, of course, is completely wrong. But it's a mistake that an awful lot of students make when I do this question with them because obviously what you should do is you should do some kind of flexed budget. So for the raw materials, you take the budget 29,050, multiply it by, well, first of all, divide by 83. That tells you the cost of one item. Multiply it by 50, tells you how much they should have spent for 15 items, and then you can compare the 15,000 with that. Now, I can't remember the answer. I normally look it up, it's at the back of the notes, but I haven't got all the notes on the screen. I've got a feeling it is 17,500 is the flexed budget. If I'm wrong, it makes it doesn't matter in the slightest if I've got it wrong. I think that's right, but if it's wrong, it doesn't matter. Now you can compare, now you can compare the flexed budget with the actual and you get two and a half thousand. It's still favourable. We've still spent less than we thought we were going to, but it's not as favourable as it looks like. So the raw materials one is a favourable variance. So is the labour. Fixed overheads obviously is the same, but the one I want to concentrate on is the revenue. Now, first of all, we've sold fewer items than we expected to. So there is a volume variance. So we've sold 50 units instead of 83. So we have sold 
33 fewer units, 33 fewer units than budget. Now, on its own, saying that we sold 33 units doesn't really give you an indication of is this a big deal or not. If we'd gone from a million and 33 down to a million, that's also a fall of 33 units, but you can see it wouldn't be a big deal. We've gone from 83 down to 50. That presumably is a big deal. So we've gone from 33 units. So we've gone from 83 down to 50. That is a fall of 33 units out of 83 as a percentage. And again, I'm afraid I can't remember what the percentage is. It's, a, it's about 40 something percent, if I remember correctly. It's a big big fall. I can't remember what the number is. I'm not going to lie to you and pretend that I can. But it is a significant fall. Now, that's a big deal. If it was a million and 33 down to a million, that would be a very small deal. But this is a big deal because 33 out of 83 is a big, big amount. Why has it happened? Well, you may remember from previous lectures, I've said that often you get, you do the numbers the numbers tell you what happens, what's happening, and the text tells you why. This is exactly the same. The sales manager had gone to the meeting where they agreed the budget. And the sales manager had said, I am not very happy with the budget. This is the 83 units that they'd ended up with. I am not very happy about that. Companies are not replacing old equipment. That means they're not going to be buying things from us. Not only that, not only that, there are some foreign products that are becoming available. That means they're going to buy somebody else's stuff instead of ours. Both of those that I've highlighted in green would both affect our sales volume. Now, the second one foreign products are becoming available, that is an example of what Porter would call a new entrant. And remember what happens when you get new entrants into the industry, sales volume goes down because people buy from the new entrant. Exactly what's happened here. What about the top one, the first one? People are not replacing old equipment. Now, that is an example of a substitute. And it's an example of a monetary substitute because people aren't buying anything. They're not buying it from our rivals. They're not buying it from us. They're, not, they're just not buying anything at all. So in other words, the sales manager said the budget is too optimistic. So. When we're looking at the actual versus the budget and the sales units is 33 units below the budget, the sales manager would say, I told you that that was going to happen. And the two reasons, as we've just said, is because of substitution. And you can then explain the monetary substitution. And it's also because of new entrants. So the sales manager would say, there was nothing wrong with our performance. It was the budget that was wrong. So you've got volume variance. I'm not going to calculate anything more than that. That's fine. And the other thing you can look at is you can look at, and I'll just put on there, that's a sales volume variance. You can also have a look at the sales price variance. Now, if you look at the sales price variance, we can work out what that is. We don't know the price per unit, but we do know the total revenue and we do know the total units. It's not exactly difficult to work out. In the budget, it turns out, I think it's fairly obvious, it turns out to be $1,000 per unit. $83,000 of revenue for 83 units is $1,000 each. Actual figures, $45,000 of revenue, uh, 900 units or 500 units, right? so that's... Get it right in a minute, there we go, $900. So the actual price that they charge is $900. Now, why might that be? 
That could be because of powerful customers, but I don't think we're told anything about powerful customers in there. But the other thing we are told is that these rivals have been undercutting our prices by 10%. So what's the sales manager done? He has also cut prices by 10% in order to match them. Remember, ports by forces, you lose sales volume. That's what's happened here. You, lose, you have to cut your prices. That is also what's happened here. So the sales manager, if the sales manager had not taken these actions, left the prices $1,000 each, it might, have been, it might have been even worse. So there are reasons why these things are happening. There are reasons in the outside world why these variances are occurring. Now, that's the key bit in this question. It's not doing the variances. They're not complicated. It's about what's, what's causing them. What, what, what difference does it make? That's what the examiner's particularly interested in. So although the calculations are straightforward, you still have to do them. Now, let's skip over on to 8.4, which talks about marginal costing. Now, notice what we've got here. Notice what it says. The emphasis is probably not going to be doing the calculations unless they're relatively easy, like the variances that I just did. What you're more likely to have to do is you'll have to, you're going to have to discuss the result this is what it means, and you'll have to discuss the method used. I think you've used a method, Mr. Examiner, that you shouldn't have done. So what you've done is mathematically correct, but you shouldn't have, it's inappropriate. I can't do anything with it. I can't analyze it because you shouldn't have used that method at all. So what you've done, the numbers add up, the numbers are correct, but you're doing something you should never have done in the first place. Now, we have an example here, again, from the pilot paper. This is a good example of the second kind of question that I was talking about. Because in this particular question, the numbers are done for us. There's all the numbers. What we have to do is say whether we agree with the decision that has been made. Now, when uh, we will see this throughout, throughout this particular session. Because there's quite a lot of numbers in this particular session, you may find it sensible at various points to stop and read through what we're doing. With the other sessions, we basically looked at an exam question at the end, and so you probably had a look at the exam question before you watched the video. With this one, we're going to come across stuff inside the sessions. So if you have already looked at this question, that's great. If you haven't, I would suggest that you pause the video and then restart it again when you're ready. I will just carry on anyway. So the idea is that we are trying to decide whether Ray is going to make the right decision or not. So if you have stopped the video and you've had a chance to read for it, Ray basically is trying to decide what he's going to do. He's trying to decide whether to, make a, whether to buy a new machine or not. So he says, over five years, the machine breaks even. So he is going to say, I think this is all right. Now, this is a big deal. I'm going to put this back at the top of the page. You may remember in chapter seven, we talked about the SFA model. Suitability, feasibility, acceptability. We talked about those three. Something is suitable, remember, if it builds on strengths, reduces weaknesses, exploits opportunities, or of reduces or avoids threats. Something is feasible if you've got the money and the skills to do it. Something is acceptable if the reward, what you're going to get from doing it, justifies the risk. Now, when we're talking about the management accounting numbers, most of them are to do with acceptability. Is the risk worth it? Will we get a big enough reward at the end of it? It's not always the case, but it is a lot of the time. So in this particular question, we need to think about Ray is taking a risk in buying this machine. Is it the right thing for him to be doing? Now, some people would put this under suitability. Some would put it under feasibility. I'm not that worried. I think it's acceptability. But if you want to put it under a different heading, then do. I really don't mind. 
So Ray is using a method, he's using a, an approach. He says, it breaks even, therefore I'm going to buy it. First thing we have to do then is we have to prove that Ray is correct. So the machine costs 90 to buy, and then each year we have $5,000 going out in maintenance. Then because we're reducing costs, reducing wastage, we're having savings, these are all cash flows coming in. At the end of year zero, your cash flow is, the, is, is negative 76. So there is 76,000 more going out than is coming back in again. Your cash flow for year one on its own, five going out, 15 coming back in, that's 10 coming in, plus four, plus two, you've got 16 coming in in year one. Now you started year one by having, 70, having spent 76 more than you'd had coming in. So at the end of year one, you've now got 60 less than when you began. Yep, so at the end of year zero, your cash flow was minus 76. In year one on its own, it's plus 16. So now put those two together, overall, it is now minus 60. And then year two, it's plus 18. So that's minus 42 is your cumulative position. Then it becomes plus 20. That means minus 22. Then it becomes plus 22. And it breaks even. So Ray is correct. At the end of that fifth year, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, at the end of that fifth year, the machine has broken even. So Ray's logic is correct. Except the question says, do you agree with the method he's used? So what Ray has done, Ray has used payback. Do you agree with that or not? Now, a lot of students say no. A lot of students say, no, I do not agree because there is no discounting in here. There's no, he, Ray hasn't discounted anything. What a lot of students say is Ray should have done an NPV. Now, in other words, they're saying Ray has made the correct decision using his method, but I think he's used the wrong method, and because he's used the wrong method, he's actually making the wrong decision. If you do that calculation, and you discount any of it, doesn't matter what you discount, if you discount any of it by any amount, it ends up it hasn't paid for itself at the end of year five. It's going to pay for itself at the end of year six, seven, eight, nine, it's going to pay for itself later on. So Ray hasn't done any discounting. Now, one of the things to bear in mind is a lot of students, I, I say to a lot of students, so what's the NPV at the end of year four? And they say it's negative. So what's the NPV? It's negative, because it's negative at the end of year four. We don't know how many more years there are. There could be a year five, six, seven, eight. It's just the examiner hasn't told us those, because Ray doesn't really care anymore. Ray says it pays for itself at the end of that year. I'm happy with it. So there may be further, there may be further years. The examiner has done this in the exam. He simply said there are some numbers and students have thought those are the only numbers, those are the only years. It's just the examiner hasn't told you what happens after year four. So there may be some further years. Something else that you discover if you read through the, um, if you read through the scenario and everything, the whole thing, this is only part of it. Ray, if I remember correctly, Ray doesn't really believe in debt. He doesn't really like, he doesn't really believe in debt, and he's the only owner of the company. Now, if he doesn't have any debt, then the cost of debt must be zero. And if he's the only owner, the cost of equity, remember, cost of equity simply means what does the shareholders need as a return? The cost of equity would be very low as well, because he's the only shareholder. So even if you do discount it, the weighted average cost of capital will probably be very, very low. And if the weighted average cost of capital is low, then the discounting doesn't make an awful lot of difference. 
you could argue that Ray has done discount. He's just all his discount factors are one. So every column has been multiplied by one. The cash flow has been multiplied by one. That's what you'd get if you had a weighted average cost of capital of zero. Weighted average cost of capital of zero would mean you don't discount anything. Even if you do discount something, it might not make a big deal, might not make a big difference anyway. So Ray's probably used the wrong method. He's used payback. But even if he did use the right method, it, he may still, you know, it might still be it's a good thing to do. So just bear that in mind, please. A lot of students will simply say net present value is good, payback is bad, and not think about it any further. Something else to bear in mind is if you are a small company, which Ray is, NMS is the name of his company, NMS is a small company, then often what's more important than the net present value is how long does it take before you get the money back? Because when you get the money back, you can reinvest it in the business. For a small company, that may be more important. Well, that's payback. That's what Ray is doing. So Ray might be using something that's appropriate for him. And students come along and say, no, do an NPV, because I remember that from F9. But NPV may not be the right thing for him to do. Now, we've talked about the method he uses. There isn't a correct answer, by the way. Um, it isn't, yes, he's done the right thing, or no, he's done the wrong thing. There's, well, it's good because it's bad because. What about the data? What about the rows? What about the five different rows that he's put in? Because even if he's used the correct method, if the data, if the numbers he's putting in aren't very accurate, useful, it doesn't really matter what method he's used. It won't really help him at all. Right, the cost of the machine, I presume, that's pretty definite. Because presumably he's phoned up the manufacturer and said, how much is the machine? So I'm happy with that one. The maintenance costs, I am not happy with. And the reason I'm not happy, why aren't they increasing? Surely, as the machine gets older, then as the machine gets older, it should need more and more maintenance, shouldn't it? And Ray's put the same amount in every year. There may be a reason for that, but I would want Ray to explain it to me. If I'm the accountant, I would like Ray to explain why he thinks the maintenance cost is going to be constant at five. As I say, there may be a reason he signed a contract, or he may be wrong. Similarly, the staff costs, why aren't they changing? Why are they staying the same? And not only that, is there anything missing? There's n there doesn't appear to be anything in there for redundancies. Well, but again, it may be because the person they're going to get rid of isn't entitled to redundancy. They might not have worked at the company long enough. But I would certainly ask Ray the question, you've missed out redundancy. Is that deliberate or did you just forget? Yeah, so your job is to come along and say, did you remember to do that? Is this, is this what you actually wanted to do? So I'm not happy about those two numbers. Now, of course, if you've done an NPV and you've calculated the weighted average cost of capital and you've done it to three decimal places, if the maintenance costs and the staff costs are wrong, then your answer is going to be wrong anyway because the data that's being used is wrong. doesn't matter if the method's right. If the data is wrong, what you've got doesn't mean anything anyway. Reduced wastage. Now, the, the reason why this is going up is because this is basically saying compared to the old machine. The old machine would have wasted more and more and more and more and more and more. The new machine means that doesn't happen. So that's why those numbers are going up. But again, if you look at what it says in the scenario, is it says... Reduced wastage of up to 10%. For all I know, Ray has just used 10%. So is this, is this realistic? Are you actually going to get 10% savings? Is that what, I mean, I don't even know if that's what Ray has used in there. But I want to ask the question, is that, is that the 10%? Is it realistic? And finally, my favourite one, energy savings. And it says in the question that they know the energy cost of the factory, but they don't know the energy cost of individual machines. 
what have they included in their business case? The energy saving of an individual machine. And they don't know what that is. So that last line, that last line is just a guess. So the moral of this particular question then is, even if you had done the weighted average cost of capital to 17 decimal places, you worked out everything, you did your discount factors, your answer would be fairly meaningless because the rows don't make any sense. What he's put in there is either wrong or it could be inaccurate. It's not going to tell us anything. Now, that's a good example of the second kind of question I asked about earlier, where he's done all the numbers and all you have to do is come along and say, well, I don't, this is what it means. It means it pays back for itself after five years, but I don't really agree with the model that you've used. I think you should have done NPV. And even if you used NPV, I don't agree with the rows that you're putting in. I think you're putting in the wrong numbers. So no real calculations there, instead interpreting of them. Now, the other three different decisions that we've got, as far as marginal costing are concerned, again, come up in the exam, but it's more important that we're happy with what does it mean? What is it telling us rather than what the numbers are? I think you would have to do these calculations but I don't think they're going to be hard. So we've got limiting factor decisions. We've got make or buy decisions coming up in a minute, and we've got relevant costing decisions coming up. So limiting factor decisions. A limiting factor, you will remember from F5, you do not have enough of a resource. That is stopping you from making as many items as you like. And because you can't make as many items as you like, you can't sell as many items as you like, you won't make as much profit as you would like. So we need to think out what's the best thing to do to maximise our profit. So we've got two products, Abel's and Baker's. Abel's makes 750 an hour. Sorry, Abel's makes 750 a unit. I do apologise. I'll get it right in a minute. Baker's makes 750 a unit. Abel's make four dollars a unit. Now the obvious answer, if you could only make one of them, the obvious answer is to make Baker's, because Baker generates more money per unit. That's obviously going to be the wrong answer. The examiner will make it the wrong answer in case anybody has done something like that and doesn't understand how this works. Because it's not the contribution per, un per unit that's important, it's the contribution per hour. So if you do the contribution per hour, you get 250, 750 over three, you get 250 an hour for bakers, you get $4 per hour for Abel's, therefore that's what you should make. You should make Abel's rather than Baker's. Now that's, that's F5, that's fairly obvious. But what if, but what if it said, imagine, imagine that I am your biggest customer. Imagine that 90% of your revenue comes from me And all I ever buy is bakers. I don't ever buy Abel's. I don't care about it. I don't need them. Right. What are you going to do now? F5 would say make Abel's because Abel's are better for us because they maximise the contribution per hour. P3 comes along and says, yeah, but if you make Abel's and maximise your contribution per hour, you will also upset your biggest customer who may well go somewhere else and may never come back again. Are you sure you really want to do that? And so sometimes in P3, we will say F5 says that, but we are going to do that because of things in the outside world. F5 doesn't bother about the outside world. Most of F5 is simply, this is what we want to do. This is what's good for us. P3 says you can't always do what you want to do. You don't always get to do what's good for you. You have to do what's good maybe for the outside world as well. So 90% of the revenue came from one customer who only buys bakers. 
I think I'd carry on making bakers. I think I would not make, um, I would not make Abel's. I just, short term, if this was only going to last a month, I'll just have to make less profit for one month. What about if it was going to be longer? What about if it was going to be a year? What about if it was going to be permanent? We were never going to have enough bakers, another, enough hours. Well, maybe what we'd also need to start thinking about would be to outsource, get somebody else to make bakers for us. We might even need to make an acquisition. Buy a company that already makes bakers or buy a company that would be able to make bakers. So there are other things we could do, which again, F5 doesn't really care about. F5 says, make Abel's, that's it. P3 says, look at the outside world and look long term as well. Short term, make Abel's, maybe. Maybe you carry on making bakers. Um, so what we're going to do in P3 is not always the same decision that we're going to make in, in F5. So another example. You, you decide that you're going to make Abel's and then you discover there is a new entrant to the industry who is going to sell Abel's. And if you're not selling Abel's, what will your customers do? They will all go to this new company. So maybe you carry on making Abel's and accept that you're going to get a little bit less money simply to keep this new entrant out so that when you can get more hours, when you can go back to making bakers again, it turns out that you've kept all of your customers with you. So there's other things to consider in P3 that we wouldn't bother with in F5. So that's the first of the three bits that we've got. Second one, make or buy decisions. Make or buy decisions, like just exactly the same as, it, as what it says. Are you going to buy something from another company or are you going to make it yourself? Right. From the management accounting point of view, very, very straightforward. You can buy something for six dollars or you can make it yourself for 950 now it's obvious i hope that 950 is more than six therefore it's cheaper to buy it than it is to make it now of course that is wrong and the reason it's wrong is when you look at marginal costing you can ignore the fixed overheads because the fixed overhead you're going to have to pay anyway. So from a decision making point of view, they make no difference at all. So what's the cost of making them? The direct materials and the direct labor and the variable overheads, the bits that change each time. So every time you make another unit, you need another 150 of materials, another 175 of labor, and another 225 of variable overheads. That comes to just 550. Which one is better? Well, making ourselves is better. We should carry on making things ourselves. Now, again, you need to think about the outside world. It may well be that making these items is cheaper by 50 cents. But on the other hand, it might be it's using up a lot of our production, which we could do something else with. Um, it might well be that the quality... I think it says in here that they're the same, but it could well be the quality is better if we buy them in from somebody else. Um, imagine, imagine it was 650. Then what lots of students will say, actually no, no well, let's keep it as it is. No, my, my mistake, let's change that. Let's say out of that $6, let's imagine that $5 is the production cost and that the last dollar is things like sales markups. What should you do now? A lot of students would now say, well, you know what you should actually do? Buy the company. Because if they can make it for $5, and that's less than we can make it for, why don't we just buy this other company? And then we can, in effect, be running the factory and we can make things for $5 instead of five fifty. That's a brilliant idea. And of course, it is a brilliant idea, except if we only need 20,000 units a year, we're only going to save $10,000. We're going to save 50 cents each time. We're going to do that 20,000 times. We're going to save 
20,000 times 50 cents, the difference between the two costs, 50 cents. We're going to save $10,000. You're telling me that we should make an acquisition, we should buy a company, and that will then enable us to save $10,000 a year. I, the com what, what happens if the company's costing a few million? Is it really worth it? So even if it was cheaper for this other company to make them, and so we might want to buy this other company, we don't use enough of these things to make it worthwhile. Now, if it was 20 million units a year, that might be very different. So just bear that in mind, please. It is, you know, if it's cheaper to... If it's cheaper for the other company to buy it, to make it, than it is for you to make it, is it worth buying the other company? Yes, if you use a lot of the units. If you only use some of them, it probably won't pay for itself. So we've got make or buy decisions. Again, just to remind you, this would not be an entire question. This would be part of a question. So you might still need to look at making an acquisition. Is it suitable? Buying something in, is it feasible? Is it acceptable? You still have to think about all these different things. The numbers are just one part of the argument. You may end up saying, the numbers tell me to buy it and everything else tells me don't buy it, so I'm not going to buy it. Over the page, we have close or continue. Now, you may remember back in Chapter 6, Back in chapter six, we looked at the BCG matrix and we said one of the headings there was problem child. Do you carry on making something or do you give up? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about with a close or continuing decision. Now, if you have a look at the numbers, we've got here product A, product B, product C. A makes a loss, B and C make profit. So the obvious thing to do is to close down A. Now, let's just look at what the total profit is first. Total profit is going to be $9,000, because obviously you've got 9 plus 3 minus 3, $9,000. So we're going to close down product A because it makes a loss. So that product is going to go. Let's see what's left. Revenue, 320000 um, variable costs, 285, that's 284,000. Fixed overheads, remember, just because you've shared out, just because you've closed down product A, you've still got to pay the fixed overheads. If that's the factory, closing product A does not reduce the amount of overhead, so that's still going to be 36,000. You've got total costs of two, oh, you've got total costs of three twenty. You've got revenue of three twenty. You make no profit. Now, why have you made no profit? Your profit has gone down. Your profit has gone down by nine thousand dollars. Why has it gone down by nine thousand dollars? Because the contribution from product A was nine thousand. If you close product A, you lose that contribution. Fixed costs don't change. You've got less money to pay your fixed costs. Your profit goes down by 9,000 as well. So it's gone from 9,000 down to zero. Sh what should you do then? F5 would say keep product A open because it's making a contribution. P3 might say no, close it down, take the money and invest more in the star. Or perhaps take the money and do something else. For all we know, product A is in decline. For all we know, product A, we've got a very small market share. Product A might be a dog, in which case you should get rid of it. Now, again, please just remember that in the exam, often, often the numbers tell one story and the text tells you something else. So it might well be that the text, in effect, says... Um, product A is in an industry where there's lots of rivalry, there's lots of substitutes, there's powerful customers. You're not going to make that. You should just, just, just get rid of it. I know it's making a positive contribution, but you'd be better off not doing it and do something else. So often the numbers say this and the text tells you something else. So just bear that in mind. 
Now, let's have a brief look at the Howsham Gardens question. So this is December 2013, and it's question three from December 2013. The question says, and again, you may want to pause the video here, that's fine. The question says that we have to show why HGT is losing money and recommend some improvements and at the same time tell us tell the examiner how much extra income or cost savings each of these improvements is going to bring. Right, so let's begin then with showing why they're making a loss. Now this is a good example. It's not a complicated calculation. Most students got it right, but you have to think to yourself what's going on here. Well, it says that um, the price of entry is $5 and there are a thousand visits a month and they're open for eight months a year. Right, so their revenue then is going to equal a thousand people a month times $5 times the eight months that they are open and that is 40 that is $40,000, so you can see they're going to make a loss. But they also get contribution from the restaurant. It says that the average visitor generates, the average visitor generates $1.25 Generates a dollar twenty-five. Sixty percent of visitors go to the cafe. I think I've written restaurant instead of cafe. Not that it matters. Yeah. So we've got a thousand people per month. Eight months, so that's eight thousand visitors. Sixty percent of them go to the cafe, and they spend on average one dollar twenty-five. So that is also income that we can get. They have contribution of $1.25. So 8,000, 60 percent now that's 4,800. That's 4,800, but I think that's another 6,000, if I remember correctly. So that is $46,000 of income, but their fixed costs are 60,000. So therefore, they're going to make a loss of 14,000. Yep, now again, I think you'd agree that calculation is not particularly tricky, but you are expected to be able to do it. Now, some of the other things that we've got here, some of the other things that we've got here, um, it says, for example, it says, for example, that HGT currently advertise in a magazine called Heritage Gardens. Each advert costs $500 per issue. It's possible to cancel the last three of these without incurring any cancellation charges. Now the question then is, should we bother? Should we bother carrying on advertising? Well, one of the things that you are told, how did people hear about the garden. 200 people, 10 of them heard about the garden through this magazine. So in other words, that is 5% of the visitors. Now what most students did in the exam was they said, you should stop paying for this advert. And they said, you should stop paying for this advert, you'd say $500 a month. But what very few of them did was they didn't work out whether financially that was the right thing to do or not. Because if you just look at the Heritage Gardens adverts on their own, there is a possibility that they're actually paying for themselves. Because remember we talked, I don't know if you remember, we talked about added value a few sessions ago. If it turns out that you're spending $1,500, $500 a month on these adverts, but they actually generate extra revenue, then you should carry on with them. 
Because if you get rid of the advert, you save the cost, but you also lose the revenue as well. Now, we said 10 out of 200, so 5% of people visit Howsham Gardens because of that. So how much money does that generate? 1,000 visitors, eight months a year, um, and they were paying $5, if I remember correctly. So we had $40,000 altogether for the, for the year. 5% of that is going to be $2,000. So this generates $2,000 per year. That's in revenue. But obviously the costs, $500 times 12, because it's obviously a yearly thing, it cost them $6,000, so therefore it is not worth it. And they should indeed close it down. They should stop, they should stop advertising. That would save them $6,000 a year. That would get them closer. They'd still be making a loss, but it wouldn't be as bad. Yeah? So they'd be get, their loss would be 8000 instead of 14000 most students said they should close it down, they should stop advertising your Heritage Gardens magazine, that will save $1,500. No, well, that's correct, but it will save, more importantly, surely, is it will save $6,000 a year. That's more important. Very few students did that. Very few students said that would make their loss only 8000 Virtually nobody did this calculation that I've got on the screen to say, actually, is it worth them closing it down? I think the examiner missed something here. If I had been the examiner, I would actually have had this so it was profitable. I would have had income, $8,000, 9000 10000 cost 6000 You actually did want to carry on with it. So you could save money by cancelling the adverts and you'd lose even more revenue. You'd actually make things worse. So I think he could have done that, but he didn't notice to do that. Or maybe he thought that would be too complicated. So again, it's not complicated calculations, but you have to think a little bit for yourself. Something else that we had in there, it talked about the fact that 20% of the respondents said that they would come to the garden uh, if it was offered for $9. If Basically, they would pay one, sl one, one off and then um, they'd never have to pay again. Is that a good thing to do? Well, that means that you would get a thousand times twenty percent. So, um, thousand times twenty percent. I should do it like that. Altogether, they get eight thousand visitors. Twenty percent of them, so that sixteen hundred, would pay nine dollars to come in and visit. But then, of course, the thing is that they would only pay that once. So that would be 14,400 that they would get. But you would now have, you'd still have the 8 times 1,000 times the 80%. They would still be paying your $5 each time. They would keep coming as they had been. Um, so again, that's 40,000 times 8 percent That's going to be 32,000. If you go to this $9, the trouble is we don't actually know how often those people were coming. So that would get you, let's see, what would that give you? That would give you 46400 which looks like it's a little bit better than you're doing at the moment, but it's still not brilliant. And of course, it might well be that they, sp it might well be that they, they come they come a lot and we would have got more money if they had come and they were paying each month. Or maybe they only came occasionally, maybe it doesn't make any difference. Remember, they only need to come twice. And for the customer, it's cheaper to buy an annual ticket. They only need to come twice. And that means that House and Gardens have lost money on that. They're not getting as much as they would have done. And it does say these were regular visitors who would do this. Um, they said they would buy an annual ticket if it was worth, if they could get it for $9. So you've got different calculations that you can do. And my favourite one that I'm just going to finish this little section with is the fact it says the average consumer would be willing to pay an entry fee of $3.25. 
Now, this is something your examiner has done a lot in different exam questions. Look at the contribution that they're going to get. The contribution they're going to get, if everybody only pays 325, they get the 325. They get a dollar 25 um, from 60% of their customers. Because only 60% of them go and visit the cafe, but 60% of them. So on average, they are going to get what? 325 plus 60% of 125. They're going to get $4. All together. Now we know, because we did it up here, the fixed costs were sixty thousand. So contribution is four dollars each. The break even visitors. You may remember the idea of break even. The break even visitors is going to be fifteen thousand. At the moment it's around about 8,000. So if they put the price down to 325, they'd virtually have to double the number of people that come and visit. That's a very big increase. Now again, it's not a big, it's not a comp, now, now you've seen it, it's not a complicated calculation to do, but most students didn't even think of doing that, let alone actually doing it. That's come up regularly, break even. Either break, another thing you could have done is you could have said, if we keep the same number of customers, what's the break-even price that we would have to charge? And it comes out at $6 something, if I remember correctly. So that idea of break-even, your examiner quite likes that. So in this case, I've done the break-even visitors. So none of the calculations are hard, but most students didn't bother with them. They did that first one. They did that one. But after that, everything they suggested had no numbers with it at all. So... The idea then is that we have to think about, we have to think about um, using the numbers to help to make a decision. We'll have a break there. When we come back, we're going to finish off chapter eight by looking at, um, we're going to look at relevant costing. And then we'll have a look at chapter nine. Chapter nine, regression analysis, time series analysis, where the examiner does the numbers for you usually and then we'll also have a brief look at expected values and decision trees where you would have to do the calculations but again they won't be quite complicated calculations so let's take a break and then when we come back we will finish chapter eight and chapter nine whenever you get around to doing it